Warhammer 40,000 Dark Tide has possibly one of the best portrayals of 40k's atmosphere across any game under the IP's umbrella, but is that always a good thing? In this video today, we're going to look at some weapons in the game that really suffer from being either too lore accurate or not lore accurate enough. We'll go over a very quick lore overview of each weapon we discuss before talking about the pain points. Now, what we'll be discussing here is really how the lore intersects with gameplay. That's the primary focus. I believe by and large that games should stay true to their IP that they pull from, but it's important to remember too that GW's main rule for Warhammer is the rule of cool first and foremost. I mean, as long as that doesn't absolutely break a rule on the tabletop. Also, that's another crucial point. Tabletop rules will never be a one-to-one -one analog with video games. Total War has shown us that across the trilogy of Warhammer Fantasy titles. The Witcher series is also a great example of a game company taking liberties with the lore to represent stronger gameplay without throwing the source material out the window. I've covered some of these weapons in my video about weapons with design flaws, so I apologize if there's a bit of overlap here, but there's only so many weapons in the game right now. You can jump ahead to any portion of the video that interests you the most using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. Also, don't forget to follow me on Twitch as I stream Dark Tide Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday every week. We do community matches, giveaways, and I ramble about a lot of dumb stuff. Lastly, if you end up enjoying the video or if you're heading out, please don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe. Each one of those helps out any content creator you watch in a huge way while also funding my mini Australian Shepherd's unending treat addiction. Let's get started here on Is Lore Accurate Always Worth It? And Warhammer 40,000 Dark Tide. To start us off, we're going to talk about chain weapons, including the chain sword, the eviscerator, and the chain axe. Now, chain weapons in Warhammer 40,000 represent probably the most common and most manufactured weapon across multiple races. Uh, you have the Imperium with the chain sword, but you also get it with the orcs. You get it with the Eldari or Eldar, depending on which portion of the lore you're looking at. And it, it's it's really one of the most common weapons you can find, even among the, the miniatures. And when we talk about the chain sword looking at the lore, we get a weapon that has a Promethean-fueled engine. So basically, it's got a little throttle or an activation thing that you uh, turn on, and the blades start or the teeth start worrying about now there are tons of different types of chain weapons and even within the existing chain weapons there's tons of different variants every single marine uh, chapter sometimes has different variants of just a simple chain sword and then you've got the chain sword which can have a two-handed variant which is as we know the eviscerator but then the eviscerator has tons of different variants so it's one of those weapons that as far as the lore is concerned, has all of these different variants. And when we take a look at the one that comes in Dark Tide, we get the Cadia Mark IV chain sword. Uh, if we're looking at the chain sword or the uh, the Abestes, whatever chain axe or the um, the Eviscerator, the, the, they, this could be Dark Tide's way of saying, well, we know the way that the lore treats the chain weapons. And so these special marks are our versions of those chain weapons. Because when you look at a lot of things in the lore, no one ever turns the chain weapon on and it has a limited use and then shuts off. Aside from the actual Promethean fuel running out. When the Promethean fuel runs out, well, the thing's just not going to throttle or whir anymore. Or if the uh, teeth were to say break off then the thing's not going to be as effective typically uh, teeth are stored in mass with any kind of army especially in the imperium moving from planet to planet engagement to engagement as well as well as las guns it's like they're that level of plentiful so when you use a chain weapon against obviously someone like an adeptus of stardust or, or, or opposing one of course anything with ceramite armor you're going to get chain weapons and chain teeth flying all over the place but uh the lore does talk about specific instances of just simply gangers in underhives and this is where we are we're in a underhive using chain weapons for their entire life because they're pretty much just using them against light targets right nothing with heavy armor and we're typically dealing with any kind of unarmored flak or carapace and we're and when we look at carapace in and of itself it is definitely a heavier armor than flak obviously but it's no ceramite so it is worth noting that we're for the most part dealing with light to medium armor when it com compares to the entire spectrum of armor available to the imperium so for me when i look at the uh the chain weapons and their execution in Dark Tide, I hit a little bit of a road bump. So let's 
is it speed bump speed bump road bump uh, roadblock speed bump whatever the hell so let's talk now about dark tides chain weapons loading into the game we've got our heavy eviscerator our assault chain sword and then the axe right there right orestes not obesties <laughs> orestes mark for assault chain axe now my biggest problem with these weapons is like i've said the limited activation i activate it and i swing and it chews through things and then it shuts off. We've talked about the Promethean being a limiting factor as far as the length of these things going. But more often than not, especially when you read books like Armageddon written by Aaron Dembski Bowden, the chain weapons are, they're being clogged up or running out of Promethean is an indication of the length of an engagement, less of the shortcomings of a weapon. They're like, oh, you know, the chain weapon is clogged up with the gore of the targets they've been killing for hours and hours or days and days on end. These are limited engagements when we take a look at Dark Tide, right? We're not going for days into these uh, limited engagements and missions. We're going through probably a handful of hours, if that. And I think that the fact that I activate, swing, and it shuts off is the biggest limiting factor to all of the existing chain weapons. And I think that a really cool way to, and of course, this is speculation, right? I mean, I'm saying this could be a cool way to change things. There would be a lot of balance issues with this. So take anything that I recommend as far as like ways that this could be changed is my headcanon or my opinion on this, on the fact. If you have different ways that you would change this, let it be known in the comment section below. But I would love if activating the chain weapons kept them on perpetually and drained your stamina. Like right now, the thing's just on right now in Revan, right? So it'd be interesting if I revved this bad boy and swung and it would simply just keep revving and allow me to do different styles of attacks. Rather than being overhead swipes like this, it would every single swing with a revved chain weapon would be cleaving swiping hits and it would just it would simply rev through it having high penetration so it would do a lot of damage to unarmored and flacked targets less of course to any kind of carapace armor because that is a medium kind of point where you're hitting higher ablative layers of armor it's going to slow things down and it'd be interesting if, if just the stamina drain like okay the user is swinging wildly through things he's having to pull his blade his or her blade through targets their stamina is going to naturally drain and this then becomes the limiting factor of the activation you can't just indefinitely keep this thing on just go into town and swing it all willy-nilly it's going to have some sort of limiting factor as as a, a level of balance right you can't just simply say oh it's turned on and i'm going to kill everything to death even when you read the william king books by or the space wolf books by william king a lot of the same thing happens like ragnar thumbs the activation rune on his chainsword and just goes to town he doesn't say i thumbed it and then i thumbed it again and then i thumbed it one more time for good measure there is a seemingly unending amount of use of these chain weapons in their small limited engagements that they're used in and i wish that that was kind of reflected here in dark tide now another very iconic weapon is the power weapon and the power weapon or the power sword in specific we're talking about dark tide is present in near every single faction in 40k you have the imperium of man which all 19 of its factions on tabletop you have chaos you've got orcs you've got eldar you've got dark eldar everyone's got some form of powerized weapon even the necrons do and th those things are kind of crazy so with the power sword we're going to ignore one of the big facts right the power sword is a very rare weapon as far as the, the Imperium's concerned. Um, but of course, we're part of an inquisitorial retinue, so we get access to a bunch of cool things that normal people of our ilk would not get access to. So there is that bit of suspension of disbelief built into the narrative already. But when we look at the actual power sword, it, ha it has a wild journey throughout the tabletop. In the earliest edition, second, third, fourth, fifth, I think all the way even up to... 7th or 8th, I, I don't remember when they changed Power Sword's damage profile, but Power Swords used to ignore armor outright, just like Force Swords used to kill targets outright. And in the more recent versions, 8th and 9th especially, Power Weapons now confer either Strength and or AP and or additional damage depending upon what type of Power Weapon it is. A Power Axe, a Power Sword, whatever it is. Um, 
And that has a pretty big profound effect on the actual tabletop, but the lore itself has remained the same. Whenever you hit someone with a power weapon, it's capable of disrupting the molecular bonds of matter when it strikes things. So it just kind of cleaves through armor like butter. And that is really how it is done up to the umpteenth degree in every single bit of lore iteration for it, right? It just simply slices through stuff. And we get something pretty similar to that in Dark Tide, right? You're kind of wreathing through things left and right. So let's now talk about the shortcomings I find with the lore and Dark Tide's representation of it. But we also have to consider the balance for it as well. So let's move back into the game. And, and with that, let it be known, of course, the Power Sword is stupid strong. It is one of the best melee weapons in the game right now. You simply turn it on, you hold down left click, and you just rip right through things. So it, it's worth know it, noting here that I don't want this weapon to be absurdly buffed. Um, and it's already gone through a round of quote-unquote nerfs that reduce the amount of cleave, cleave targets that it can hit. But if we're talking about how that lore activation works, this is very similar to the chainsword. No one in the lore says that they keep reactivating their sword over and over. And sometimes swords are actually collect, or, uh, connected to a power bank on some of the older Imperium, uh, Imperial Guard models. More of the recent stuff just kind of shows, just like you see here, the power bank is actually located in the hilt of the sword. So... What I think could be cool, too, is the same thing that we get with the chainsword as far as a proposed quote-unquote lore-accurate fix, or whatever the hell I'm trying to say, is turning it on, keeps it on, and it drains your stamina as you're using it, so I don't have to just keep, I'm not limited to two, three, maybe four swings if I have the blessing that increases the amount of swings I get when I have it activated. Um, and I guess you could also argue that that blessing could be changed to making it so that it, the amount of stamina is reduced when it is activated as far as the drainage goes. So this way you have a weapon that is still strong, fits kind of a little bit better with the lore, and doesn't have this arbitrary constant need to turn things on, swing, turn things on, swing. You get this when you look at the crusher for the uh, um, zealot or the power mall for the Ogren, you're always having to turn them back on. And I think that kind of makes for a tedious level of gameplay. It's not necessarily very realistic to the level of carnage this weapon is supposed to deal out from a quote-unquote lore standpoint. Let's move over to another weapon that I think could use a bit of a different tooling from the lore. One of the coolest ranged weapons in the game is the plasma gun. And the plasma gun in both tabletop and in dark tide is very satisfying when it comes to getting a really good shot off and doing a lot of damage. But in the lower end tabletop, it's a little bit different, right? You have the chance for the gun to overheat. You now have the chance in tabletop to choose to take like an overheated shot, which increases the AP and does damage to the, to the wielder, a mortal wound. It used to be, I think it was like if you roll a six or a one, I think it's if you roll a one uh, to hit with a plasma gun, the gun would then roll a wound against you, the wielder, because it overheated. So you had a lot of uh, random variants built into the plasma gun. And the plasma gun, by and large, is a really also super rare weapon. We're ignoring that, obviously, here with the constraints of the game and all that fun stuff. But here's like a here's a pretty cool little breakdown of um, how this bad boy works. So when a handheld plasma weapon is fired, hydrogen fuel is fed into a miniature fusion reactor core contained within the weapon's mechanism and superheated to extreme temperatures into a highly energized state of matter known as plasma, the fuel of the stars themselves. The generated plasma is held in the weapon's core by powerful electromagnetic confinement fields. When fired, the fields dilate open and the plasma is ejected via the coils of a linear magnetic accelerator as a bolt of superheated matter akin to a solar flare in appearance and temperature so it's a lot of fun but it's also like one of the scariest things i think to wield in the imperium by a, just an everyday soldier as far as at least what what's concerned as uh what the varlets are right what, what, what which you are in the game so there is a lot of innate danger built into them right and there is that that fear that they could overheat even moreover the i guess you call what you would look at as a magazine right the the plasma flask the little thing that you that you put into shoot that thing is extremely lethal in and of itself because if you do it slightly wrong the whole thing explodes killing the user so there's a lot of danger attached to the plasma weapon and dark tide has taken that danger and really tried to replicate it as much as it can making it a weapon that feels 
far scarier to use than actually do damage with. And I think that that's both a cool thing as far as the lore is concerned, but a detrimental thing as far as the gameplay is concerned. So let's move over to the game and talk a little bit more about the plasma weapon. I mean, look at this thing. We have the M35 Mark II MagnaCore plasma gun. Now, this is the same plasma gun that's used predominantly by the Adeptus Astartes, but there's tons of different marks of plasma gun, even different variants. Like, there's an Akachan one for the Elysian drop troops. This is more of a bullpup design with a faster firing rate and more damage output. But, uh, again, that's going to be way more lethal, right? So... With this gun, it's obviously going to be doing a ton of damage to Carapace. It's the, that's its primary target, is heavy armor. And as I just simply left-click this, it's going to get higher and higher to 100%. When I get to 100%, press left-click, it drops down to 80, and it does a minor amount of damage to me. So pretty much you're only going to really ever be using the left-click on this gun. Now, once I get it to 100, though, let's get it back to 100. I can, well, I can do this. I can reload it and completely vent all of the heat and restart. I can conversely right click and shoot, right click and shoot and right click and shoot. It's nice to just drop the bulwark shield. Now I right, reload again and I completely drop the heat. What I find kind of detrimental to the style of play of Dark Tide, even though it does kind of lend itself to the fact that, hey, this is supposed to be a very, very deadly weapon that if someone were to hit the coils, you'll die. If someone were to hit the 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 flask, you'll die. Like there's so many ways that this thing can actually hurt you. But it becomes, I think, a little anti-fun is the fact that if I'm using this thing constantly, let's get it back up to 100 again. If I'm using this thing and just kind of shooting through stuff, oh, I'm going to take damage right here. It kind of makes it so that I don't want to use the weapon because I'm taking a lot of damage. And if I want to vent it, I can manually vent it. But that causes me damage. That's, I think, the biggest problem here. I'm either shooting my primary and then having to vent it by the fact that I've gotten to 100% and it drops naturally by 20% causing me damage, or I get up to 100% and vent it manually and it causes me damage for a certain threshold. Like you, as you saw here, it won't really cause me damage until I get to the 50% mark. Anything over 50% heat will cause damage for me. So there's so many convoluted ways that this thing causes damage. And I think that it makes it a less enjoyable weapon because I can get more reliable damage out with almost any other weapon for the veteran and not have to deal with the shortcomings of the damage. I can use the bolt gun and just rip through things or stagger things or suppress things far more reliably. So I think that this is an instance where it is by and large, pretty lore accurate to have this thing be such a volatile weapon. But I think that when it comes to a gameplay mechanic standpoint, it ends up hindering the gun from being useful in a wider, higher difficulty range of the game because you're pitted with so many hard targets or such a vast amount of targets that you don't want that little application of damage, especially with the way that toughness works and the damage that can push through your toughness and end up killing you. If you're below one wound, you're using your plasma gun, you might actually push this thing up. Let's get up to 100 or get up to 100 again. Push this thing up, shoot again, and that just did damage to you. Then something hits you from behind because there's no control of what's behind you in this game for some weird random reason. And that was just enough little extra damage to completely KO you. So I think that there that there becomes a little bit of a gameplay and a fun issue with the plasma gun, even though it's such a badass and a fun and enjoyable weapon in the game. Next up is the Lucius Pattern Lasgun. Now we have three different variants throughout Dark Tide, and this is a signature weapon of the Death Corps of Krieg. And the way that this weapon is supposed to work, of course, is that it basically has a further range, it does more damage, but at the cost of pulling more from the power pack that is a standard Munitorum issue power pack. So basically you get less ammo per shot. And we get that represented in the game, right? We get far less shots than most of the other LAS guns because this is a higher hitting charged up LAS gun. And that, that is true too, is that this thing does drain the power by charging things up and it has a big old heat sink to prevent things from overheating. That's another thing. This gun actually does overheat a lot. When it's overtaxed, it can, it can actually overheat and end up, well, killing the user. So the lore on this is, of course, pretty uh, cut and dry because you're looking at the Death Corps of Kree who are very modeled after World War I style of um, 
soldiers across a bunch of different fields here. And I've done a whole lore video on the Death Corps of Krieg and, and the Lucius Pattern Lasgun, and this fits roughly with well how this is supposed to uh, be portrayed in the lore. In fact, I think it's a pretty good analog one-to-one. -one. But again, I think this is another issue where we're hitting a one-to-one -one translation that doesn't really pull off very well in Dark Tides. So let's transition back over. So here we have it, a pretty awesome looking gun. Uh, I think the Death Corps of Krieg are probably the most popular Imperial Guard regiment too, or at least well, most well known. Um, and as far as like the, the consumer goes, uh, when you take a look at it, you're aiming down sight, you're holding left click, you're charging it up, you're taking a shot. And in a static environment or lower difficulties, this is a really, really fun weapon. You know, you just kind of shoot things, you're tight, you're taking lots of damage, doing lots of damage, it's fun, you go into your special stance, you kill things very quickly. But the problem is that in this environment, it's very easy to see pretty much anything, right? I don't really need a, sweet, a solid sight picture. Uh, I'm fine with just the, uh, the iron sights on this. But the issue is, and looking at this thing, it's already got like a rail on the top of it. It needs a better sight picture. And we know that this is, that is not common for nearly anything in Warhammer 40K. Uh, scopes, ACOGs, reflex scopes, all that stuff are not so common. It has become a more of a recent conven convection, convection, or not baking things, convention in Warhammer 40k to see things with scopes on them. Because I think we understand by and large that things do need scopes on them for prolonged series of combat like that. And, and when we look at the older, older lore, things are shooting from the hip all the time. And if you watch the movie Commando, Arnold Schwarzenegger is just shooting from the hip. All 80s action movies, everyone's shooting from the hip. But as we've gone more in depth and gotten more tactical with our understanding of how things really work when it comes to uh, military combat, you see more and more uh, scopes being applied to Warhammer 40k imagery. A lot of more of the of the Primera stuff now has tons of scopes on it and what have you. Even the, the old, like, I want to say 4th or 5th edition Imperial Guard Codex has a whole ton of Cadians with scopes on their LAS guns. And we get LAS guns with scopes on them in the game, at least a red, red dot or reflex scope on it, right? So I think that this is an instance where this thing is like a one-to-one, -one, but I kind of wanted to break the lore and have a scope on it so that I can actually reliably shoot things. If I'm going to be really just drowning in a deluge of uh, hordes and hard targets, give me the ability to not waste this shot because the shot is what makes this such a strong weapon. You can argue, hey man, that's a skill issue, dude. Get better at the game. Sure, whatever, fine. But it should not be to the point that you can't reliably use it in damnation because it is per the, the gun's design is what's hindering you from actually enjoying it because missing those shots is just so crucial when it's such a hard target destroyer. And you can't really reliably kill hordes of uh, hordes of things with this thing, even though it actually has a pretty large, this is a Mark III, for example, um, a pretty reliable, reliably good shot. It doesn't pass through, so you're limited in the amount of horde clear you can do. And depending upon the LAS gun, you either have um, a swing, or I think one of them has a stab for the Lucius pattern. So I think this is a gun, like I said before, that could just use a little bit of tweaking away from the, its lore representation to make its gameplay a lot more succinct and a lot more fun. Our next conversation piece is actually not a set weapon, but more the blessing from a weapon. When you look at the force sword for the um, Psyker, it has a deflector blessing, which allows you to stop shots in midair. My problem with that is that I just want psychers to be able to do that either through a feat or whatever maybe that's just the innate ability of the force sword just something that it's not relegated solely to a blessing and i don't think that they should have the ability to just simply block all shots i think there should be some limiting factor behind this either it's stamina it's a specific feat selection in level 20 25 or 30 whatever it is um, maybe just the four sword itself is what allows you to get blessing innately built into the gun or into the uh, uh, i'm sorry into the weapon itself into the, the into the sword so that you can get that deflecting capability and the lore for this is that we get psychers in so many different ways and approaches and this is a psychonetic psyker which you would imagine already having some sort of ability to prevent these shots from already landing now there is a uh i guess kind of deep dive on a uh what's it called a data mined bit of information for a psyker that has some form of uh ability like this but we don't really know 100 percent on what that um 
uh, what that code is actually saying as far as its abilities and if they actually do have some sort of baked in deflector. But I think the deflector as a perk, if we're thinking of the lore accuracy of a psyker, it would make sense to me that they would have some, again, especially as a lore accurate psychonetic, having some sort of way to um, create a psychonetic barrier to stop, limit, or uh, reduce the damage of range fire, especially with how much range fire is an extreme, extreme detriment to you in damnation because you can just get unlucky, get three or four reapers, and that could end your playthrough real early in a mission. And if you're playing as the uh, psyker, you are very much a glass cannon with a heavier emphasis on glass than cannon, especially in damnation, since headburst or what is called smite in the code does not scale with difficulty. It's a flat amount of damage. So these things are extreme limiting factors to the psyker that I think that having deflector built into the class as either a tack onto the four sword naturally that it doesn't need to be linked to a blessing or linked to a feat would increase the survivability of the psyker psychonetic. So one of the last points I want to bring up is about not necessarily modular weapons in the sense of a Call of Duty, right? They've already said this is not Call of Duty. I don't expect four grips and a bunch of different magazines and a different stock and a whole different receiver, all these things to enter into Dark Tide. That is not what I'm saying at all. But I think some sort of way to kind of custom fit out things a little bit better. And that is pretty lore accurate, right? When we take a look at the fact that we are part of that inquisitorial retinue, we get that kind of like special forces level budget to do a lot of modular different things to our guns. Rather, it's a different uh, reflex or I don't want to say ACOG scope, but just stuff like that that gives a little bit different of a sight picture or a different portrayal of a gun would be a lot of fun. And it's worth noting too that there are so many different marks of so many different guns in this game, even some of the things that we've talked about. And like I said earlier in the video too, they Fat Shark could be making the distinction, hey, well, you know what? What you're taking a look at is mark XYZ of this gun. We're looking at one ABC of this one. So it's like they could use that as a basically a scapegoat to say, well, this is why it's not that way. It's this way because that's our mark of the gun. And that again falls into the umbrella of that's the way that uh, the lore is, right? Like, oh well, here's this other mark. We're 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 Games Workshop. We're we're the we're Dan Abnet. We're going to make it this one in specific. And that could also be something that could be done for crafting when whenever that is fully implemented. But the point that you have that limitation of eighty percent on every single value. What if the modularity of a gun was more? Hey, you know what? I want more ammo on this. So give me 90% on rather than 80%, but then I'm going to take 5% uh, from two separate other categories or maybe 10% from one other category. So maybe I don't want as much damage or as much collateral, as much stopping power. I want more ammo or whatever it is. Give us that ability to kind of play with those modifier roles on our weapons to get more out of guns because a lot of guns just simply need either more damage or more ammo or both. But I think that just simply having all guns have more ammo and more damage maybe kind of defeats the use case behind them. So maybe having some sort of sacrifice or a give and take or a compromise for having more ammo or damage or what have you being uh, something that then pulls from another portion of the gun. I, I think that, it, yeah, it all can just be fin fixed by a balance patch or this and that, but you have to wait for those balance patches to land or some sort of buff patch to make that uh, buff patch land. So I think having some system built in where we can give and take from stats, I think would be a very huge step up for Warhammer 40k Darktide. And at that, it brings our video here to a close. So we've covered a lot of these weapons and other things, and I've talked about the design flaws I have behind them and their ethos and what have you. But I think that increasing the kind of playability of a lot of these weapons is going to come down to really changing things away from the lore or maybe making them more in line with the lore. I think that throwing the term but the lore is really a limiting factor to a game that has so many cool things going for it when it comes to the atmosphere uh the enjoyable gameplay loop not withstanding content drought and any kind of bug fixes but we'll, we'll get there in a, at a different time but again I, I still think that just kind of throwing hey you know the lucius La pattern las gun shouldn't have a different side on it because that's not how the lore is eh. It's not like that until someone decides to write it. The power sword for Eisenhorn is like a lightsaber. No one else has anything like that. So, I mean, that's my point is that the lore is only applicable when it matters for an argument. You know what I mean? 
It is not some sort of dogmatic creed that isn't changing with every single black library writer who decides to do a different take on things. And remember too, this game is doggedly looked after after game by Games Workshop. Games Workshop looks over all of their IPs and all of the writings of the black library authors. Things don't just get in and sneak between the cracks. They're allowed to be the way that they are. So if anything changes, like, hey, you know, that's not very lore accurate. Well, if it's in the game, it is considered by and large canon because Games Workshop allowed it to be in there. They are not ones to trifle with their IP. So I think that these little allowances or these little changes and these little tweaks here and there would make the game either more fun, make things more lore accurate or less lore accurate and still more fun. Go ahead and let me know in the comment section below some things that you would like to see change to the game that maybe are lore accurate. I don't know of speed loader, speed loaders being used in, in the 40k universe, either yes or no. I don't, I don't really remember any instances of them being used or not used, but I'd love to have a stub revolver with a goddamn speed loader, or maybe having some sort of different applications for shotguns or different weapons in the game. Always down to hear different ideas that you guys might have. But as always, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.